introduce today. One, a good friend of both Bill's and mine is Dr. Bob Willis. He's walking across the back there. And we met Bob back in about 1993 when he was doing uh, consulting with a program called a coaching program. And Bill was in his first group. I was in his second group. And we later met in an alumni group. And uh, Bill is also one of my mentors. Still good? Oh, okay. Bill's also one of my mentors and brought me and introduced me to the IOMT. And you'll hear how important that was later in our talk. Um, Bill and I have been good friends. We started doing this course together a couple of years ago. And Bill's one of uh, a very good biological dentist from North Carolina. And doesn't need much introduction. When we introduce each other, we just tell you all we are good friends. We're passionate about the subject material you're going to hear today. And we think it's going to be as important for you as it has been in our lives. So you got your mic. And also, Bill uh, has been skiing lately. <laughs> and, uh, he, look, he looks pretty good up there, but I think he's got about three uh, career-ending injuries. <laughs> yeah, he's got a big brace on one knee. Broken leg, the torn up rotator cuff. So he's probably going to sit down in just a few minutes to do this lecture. Now, now we'll introduce Joe Palmer there, too, a very dear friend of mine. And as, you, as he said, we met kind of through Bob Willis. And actually, we did meet through Bob Willis and remained friends for, for a good long while. And he became active in the IOMT. And we were asked several years ago to do this course. And thanks to Joe, he, he's the... The, my, my electronic brain's behind this because he's certainly responsible for these slides. I, I like to say I collaborated with him, but he really did the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation because he's light years ahead of me on the computer. Um, I've been involved in the, in the IOMT for about 15 years, but uh, until recently have been not had a capacity of teaching and or um, management or the politics side of this, but I'm now the executive vice president of the IOMT, and of September I'll become the president. Um, I have been the program chairman for years and relinquished that, so uh, clinical practice committee chairman. So I've been involved with the IOMT quite a while and uh, very passionate about what we do. And I'd like to also tell you, you know, Joe and I are here. We don't get paid for this. We, we're on our own ticket. Uh, we come because we believe in what we're doing. Uh, we make a difference for our patients and our own personal lives. Um, but uh, and we're here to share what we've got, you know, what we know and what we've been through. Um, so just a, as a little bit of background, that that's where I'm coming from now. As Joe mentioned, um, I love to ski. Snow ski is my sport, and spend the year trying to stay in reasonable shape so I can do that. I just turned 60 last March, last Friday, excuse me, and uh, had the unfortunate situation of being out in Agosa Springs, or uh, fortunate but for a while, uh, skiing. Uh, uh, an area called Wolf Creek, which is a wonderful area in southwest Colorado to ski if you love to ski trees and really deep snow. And uh, one day wound up re-injuring a rotator cuff on the right side, the next day uh, pulling a groin muscle in my right side, and then the third day, which I thought, man, I can't stand any more of this, uh, wound up uh, twisting my knee and breaking the ACL, MCL, and fracturing the, the part of the left side of my knee. So. I've got a brace on, as Joe said, if I sit down, it's not because I'm disrespectful to the audience, it's because I did my not can't stand no more. So at any rate, uh, with that, we'll, we'll get started. Um, any questions you've got, be happy to answer them. We don't claim to be absolute authority here. Uh, we, we have information that we want to present to you, and uh, it's in a kind, caring way. A lot of us, we've all been to dental school or assisting school or whatever. We have our own beliefs. We have our own passions. Um, how many in here are members of the IOMT? Or we have some? Okay, so we got a good number of members here. Uh, new people? New people? Never been in here before? Had a couple ladies at lunch? Okay, good. Anybody still placing amalgams? Don't have to be embarrassed about it if you are. Nobody? Wow. That's great. Cool. Well, that's the first time I think that's happened. Well, anyway, okay, we'll get started and I'll do the best I can. And if you have questions, like I said, let me know. All right, we, uh, Joe and I had the privilege uh, two years ago of going through, and part of the advantage of this uh, organization is you have a lot of splinter, different directions you can go. We both became certified uh, on naturopaths, which we use in our practice. It's not only an uh, interesting thing to do, beneficial thing for your patient, 
but it's also a fun quest for knowledge. Uh, you know, some of us are uh, junkies for education, and Joe and I tend to do a lot of courses, not always together, but that was a fun uh, year and a half we spent um, increasing our knowledge and increasing our patient uh, treatment. So that's uh, something that comes out of this organization. Just a little overview. I'll be a little slow on this thing. What we're going to be presenting today, uh, basically the fundamentals of mercury, uh, a little chemistry. I don't want to bore you. It won't be a whole lot of chemistry. But in order to get accredited for the IOMT, you've got to take this course. The test questions will be, you know, part of what we're going to try to cover here. You also have some written material I think you've gotten that would be helpful. So we're going to cover that. Um, we're going to cover, Joe will do the second part of this. We're actually going to talk about how to do mercury safe dentistry in your office, what you're going to have to have the equipment you want to want to buy, the techniques we use, and it varies a little bit degree. Joe does some things different than I do. I do some things differently than he does. Then that's true of the whole organization. I know Dr. Kennedy this morning, very entertaining speaker, very, very bright guy. Dr. Kennedy is probably one of the world authorities on fluoride. His perio is different than mine. I use ozone techniques. Joe does DNA, I think, DNA analysis, that, that technique. Um, but we're all trying to achieve the same thing, which is biological dentistry, making the patient better, trying to improve their health. So even though we talk about this is how I do this, there's variations in the whole protocol. What it means to be a member of the IOMT, we'll cover that. And communications in the biological dental office, uh, how to market this, how to get across the patients the value, uh, what, how do you train the staff, uh, what do you tell people, how do you deal with insurance companies. A lot of these things I don't have specifics on, my, my staff does. But Joe and I also have a breakout tomorrow afternoon. And those who are not familiar, tomorrow afternoon will be 50-minute segments. And it'll be, I think they run three at a time in, in different rooms. So you can go in and you kind of chip, pick and choose what you want to listen to. But what Joe and I are going to do, is it, is it 1.45, Joe? We think it is. It'll be in the schedule tomorrow. But what we're going to do is we'll have 50 minutes of questions and answers. And uh, if you have anything you don't get answered today, for instance, what do I do first? What's the most important thing to get? Uh, what do we tell patients? How do you stop doing, uh, you know, placing amalgams? Of course, we don't have that problem here. But we'll try to answer anything because I found in the past, and this is, I think, the fourth time Joe and I have done this course, a lot of people leave here with questions and they don't get started Monday morning. We really want you to get started as soon as possible because you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in this. And a lot of times in the past I've found it's kind of like the difference between a monkey and a bear climbing a tree. Uh, a monkey climbs a tree and hardly moves a branch. Well, a bear climbs a tree, breaks branches off, and that's what we want to kind of do today. We want to break enough branches off that we get our message across so that we can change how you practice, so you can change how you deal with your life as far as mercury is concerned, your staff's life, your family. Um, when you go home, if you're, if you're inhaling mercury all day, you're exhaling mercury all evening. You've got it on your clothes. You've got it on your skin. Um, come on. Welcome. Come on in. Uh, so, you know, we're, we'll cover a lot of that stuff. And it finally it will be a call to action. And my, my goal here today is to get you accredited in the IMMT. I'm going to be blunt with you. That's what we want to do. Um, I'm not going to be beat around a bush. I mean, that's what I want to do. I want to get everybody in this room, if we can, accredited at some time in the IMT. We want everybody to be members. Um, we want to grow our ranks so that we can change dentistry and how dentistry is practiced in this world. Uh, the IMT is very active. In the UN right now, we're active uh, against the FDA. We're trying to persuade uh, legislation that would more or less make amalgam more difficult to do. We're very involved in the environmental aspects of amalgam. And remember that uh, amalgam that goes into the mouth is eventually going to go into the environment. You're either going to exhale it, it's going to be cremated, it's going to go into the ground, or you're going to come out in the feces. Somehow or another, every bit of that amalgam in your mouth or the patient's mouth is going to come out into the environment. So here we are talking about coal, which is the biggest reason we have mercury in the environment, burning of coal. But remember, all the amalgam in these people's mouths and your mouths are, are going into the environment at some point. So we're working with the UN and different conferences uh, around the world to also uh, stop the, the, the use of mercury. <clears throat> so the information you hear is derived from science, uh, delivered by clinicians, research scientists, and health professionals, which is what the IOMT is. We're not just a group of dentists. We have uh, PhD research people. We have physicians. We have chiropractors. We have all kinds of folks involved in our organization uh, who are members and, and help. And uh, we rely on outside funding 
put men apart, and we also have uh, our own research going on. And that's a good uh, quote by Carl Sagan, is the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, meaning just because you can't prove to the shadow of a doubt that mercury is causing disease doesn't mean it necessarily isn't causing disease. And we can't, we can't show anybody that MS is caused by, um, let's say, mercury exposure. We can't say Lou Gehrig's is. We can't say anything, fibromyalgia. And you'll find, um, you can find documents on the web for sure that shows that mercury poisoning is, you know, a, a, there's a thousand different symptoms behind it. We don't know if that's all true or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But we do know it's not a good thing to have in your body. And I think we all wouldn't be here if we, if we didn't believe that. And one of the things we don't want to do is stand up here, or, the, or as far as the IMT, I'm just representing the IMT, is have an opinion we're right and you're wrong. That's not why we're here. This is our opinion. We believe strongly in it. Um, and we're here to communicate. We're, ha we're happy to hear someone else's opinion and talk about that. And changing the current mercury policy, as I mentioned, is probably going to be done through environment, environmental issues. We know the mercury in your mouth is going to go back into the streams and rivers and the soil and the air. So probably the way to stop mercury from being placed in teeth is, by, uh, is from the environmental issue because we don't want to wind up back into the environment. Now, this is a picture of my... Joe took this of me a couple of, well, two years ago, as a matter of fact. This is uh, right when I bought a computer. Uh, we have computers in the office and all that, but I had been computer illiterate up until about two years ago. And, uh, you know, I finally realized when I first, I, I've been practicing 32 years, got out of dental school in 1979 from Indiana University, and moved to a small town of Yatkinville, North Carolina. Now, Yatkinville is not exactly a, a big spot. It's about uh, 2,700 people, something in that neighborhood. And I'm about a half a mile from Winston-Salem. I don't know if any of you are from North Carolina or down that way. Um, so there's a lot of folks in and around the area, but my little town is not very large. But uh, what, what got me into the IMT uh, originally about 15 years ago was that uh, I had an aunt, Aunt Bai, my mother's sister, um, dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. I t told this story at the table to a couple ladies, and I've told it before. And, and uh, at the time she was dying, my mother said, you know, Aunt Vi has had the same symptoms that her mother had, my grandmother, and we always thought my grandmother died of MS. Well, my grandmother probably died of Lou Gehrig's. Well, my aunt died of Lou Gehrig's, and since then, four of my cousins, first cousins, have died of Lou Gehrig's on my Aunt Vi's side. So when Aunt Vi was dying, I noticed that she lived in New Jersey, so I didn't really have a lot of contact with her, uh, had a mouthful of mercury fillings. Now, whether that caused her disease or not, I don't know. But it got me to thinking, I'm in a very mercury-rich environment, and every day I'm working with mercury, I'm placing it at that time, I was removing it at that time without any precautions. So it'd probably be wise to find out how to do it properly. So that's what got me involved. A very dear friend of mine from years ago, Bob Colt, urged me to do that. And my first meeting was in Durham in, I don't know, 1996 or something like that. And I, I really found this the weirdest dental meeting I've ever attended because nobody showed pictures of teeth. People had Birkenstocks on and ponytails, and they had the most weird beliefs that some of these anesthetics could cause cancer and that perio disease could cause uh, heart disease and the perio could cause uh, aneurysms and pneumonia. And they go, what are you talking about? The mercury's not good for you? I, I just couldn't believe it. So, but after I got a t meeting or two, I found out these were, you know, probably the most educated people I've ever been around. And again, one of the few meetings I go to, we don't show slides of teeth, but it's, it's become quite comfortable. And that's where my kind of history of the IMT has been. And my evolution has been to continually change my practice. Um, Bob Willis is one of the people, along with the Panky Institute and the IOMT. Those three things have probably been the biggest motivators and changers in my practice in the past 32 years. Um, so I've continually evolving, as you all are, continually changing things. And uh, we practice, and there's my staff's been with me uh, upwards of 28 years. Uh, we don't have a large staff, but we practice four days a week, 175 days a year, and we work, we work hard, and uh, we like what we do. I'm not getting this to work. I got the wrong button, that's why. All right. So, go ahead and start off with a little bit of mercury 
and what to expect from the fundamentals course. Well, I'm going to give you a little history of mercury. Uh, I'm going to give you a history of the amalgam wars that have happened over the past that are still happening. A uh, little bit of chemistry about mercury. I'm sure again, I guarantee not to bore you. I won't make it too long, too passionate. My, my major was chemistry and physics in college, and I've forgotten about everything I learned about two of those things. Uh, minored in French, and I, that's completely gone. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit of mercury safe, uh, occupational patient safety. Joe will handle that and strategies. And then at the end, some legal considerations. I've been you know, in trouble with the board off and on for the last three or four years, not because of patient treatment, uh, never for that touch wood, but it's always been how I uh, market myself. Uh, I do radio, I do a radio show, I do a lot of radio commercials. And what they got me on was the, uh, the, my internet section, my webpage. I made a mistake of saying uh, the most comfortable experience. Now, North Carolina is um, conservative, to say the least, extremely conservative in the board. And they decide that, and it may be true in many states, that you can't use a superlative to describe yourself or your treatment. So most was not a word I could. I could say comfortable experience, comfortable treatment, but you can't say most comfortable. Um, and also I had to put general dentist on every page. And they, then we fought forever. They didn't want me to call it a mercury filling. They said, oh, we want you to call it an amalgam filling. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. The FDA says it's a mercury filling. So we fought and fought, and they finally agreed I could call it a mercury filling. Then they came back and said, we want you to call it a mercury amalgam filling, a mercury silver filling. No, that's going to be a mercury filling. So I spent upwards of $12,000 with attorney fees to get to the point where, you know, I can say a mercury filling. Oh, and the other, and we'll talk about this later. The other thing was mercury safe. Um, that was one of the things I had in there. And, and no, it's mercury free, excuse me. And then they pointed out the fact I had fluorescent light bulbs, which have mercury in them. All right. So I said, how about mercury safe? So we had to go round and round about that for a while. And then I had to, I had to submit papers about my mercury separator, prove to us it takes out 95% of the mercury. I had to go to the manufacturer and get all this stuff. Anyway, I don't want you to get in trouble with the board. You, you might get by, but it costs you a lot of money to do that. So it's best to avoid it if you can. What is a biological dentist? Well, that's fairly simple. It's a dentist that utilizes the latest technology and techniques to protect his patient, team, and doctor from hazardous dental materials. Every material we have is hazardous to somebody. I don't care what composite it is. Uh, we do a lot of biological testing with our patients to determine what materials they can use. And that's just, we'll explain that later. It's called a Clifford test. And it's 6,500 different materials that they can test with a simple blood test, and then you get a report back that tells you what to, what to put in their mouth. So some things we think, gee, a composite's a composite, not according to the energy antibody reaction test that we get back. Um, so those things are important to the biological dentist and to the patient too. So uh, very, very important to realize that whatever we do to a patient can, be, can have a negative effect, not necessarily a painful effect, a negative systemic health effect. A dentist that realizes materials that are used do affect biological systems, meaning not only mercury, but the composites we use. The bisphenol A that are in some of these composites could have an effect on people. We're doing testing now to find out if that's in fact or not. And so far, it hasn't seemed to be too big of a deal. However, uh, I'm more concerned about the water bottles we walk around with. That may have bis more bisphenol A because those water bottles are stacked in grocery stores, they're stacked in gas station parking lots out in the sun. I mean, and we go buy these things, and everybody's drinking out of these bottles, so that may wind up being a bigger problem than anything. And the problem with bisphenol A, just the, it, it, it's an estrogen-mimicking compound. And uh, it was brought up a while back, and maybe testosterone is so important, not testosterone, so Viagra, is because uh, men are drinking all these water bottles, maybe they're overdone with estrogen. So I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but it's something to think about anyway. So uh, bisphenol A is something that we, we're concerned about. All right, this is an interesting thing that happened years ago. And some of this information I'll give you is going to be old only, and we only presented the fact that it's not, all this stuff isn't brand new. It's been out there a long time. Some people just have chosen to ignore it. Some people don't care about it. But Offenbacher at University of North Carolina, which is, again, a very conservative school, uh, said back in 19, or excuse me, 2001, the pathogen can cause platelet aggregation, increased lipid enhancement, erythema, formation, and increased calcification. The same oral pathogens can be found in the heart, liver, and arterial plaque formations. Well, that's news then. Today we know that perio disease is what he's basically talking about. 
can cause heart disease, it can cause, uh, I think, ulcers and pneumonia, aneurysms, and a lot of other things, and connected with diabetes. So I'm sure a lot of us are talking to our patients today, when we did back in 2001, that, you know, perio is not just gum disease, it's also a life-threatening situation. Okay, now, a little history here. The Chinese back in the 7th century realized that if you took silver and ground it fine, mixed it with mercury, it would form a paste that would harden. I don't know if we have any evidence that they actually used that for filling, but they were the first society or people to actually discover amalgam. And back in 1816, a guy named Augustus Travaux, who was a Frenchman, I believe, was, he took the, uh, the, 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 amount, the uh, silver fillings and he would shave the sides off of them, mix it with amalgam, and actually use that for filling material in people's teeth. Now remember, back in 1816, dentistry was pretty crude. I mean, you'd extracted a tooth, or somehow or another, I guess, ground it with a belt-driven, foot-pumped handpiece, I guess, uh, the decay out, and stuck this crude filling in there. Now, that's, does anybody know why they put ridges on the side of the quarters, or half dollars? You know, the little, on the, on the edges of the coins? Well, they did that so that you couldn't scrape the silver off these coins. So once you take those ridges off, someone knew that was tampered with. So even today, some of our coins still have those ridges, but it goes back to the fact that people back then used to scrape these uh, silver coins. And then in 1833, the Krakow brothers came from France to Britain to New York, and they actually said they were the first dentists to come in and start using amalgam in the United States, and uh, they were pretty competitive. And back in those days, again, there wasn't a lot of choices. It was either extraction, amalgam, or gold. Now, I don't know how much the technique was back then to do gold on lays and fillings, but even back when we had slow speed hand pieces, which was before my time, uh, I still admire some of the dentistry that comes in my office that was done back in the 50s before high speed hand pieces came out. But these guys were pretty good entrepreneurs, and they set up a business, and they started doing a lot of amalgam fillings. Well, at that time, the, the American College of Dental Surgeons um, was formed, and the surge, these guys believed that they, we shouldn't be using amalgam. They knew that phys, the, 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 uh, the, the Mad Hatter's disease, which we're all familiar with now, from the felt industry, you take wool, and somehow, and I don't know what the compound is, but you run mercury and a mercury chloride or whatever it is, and you form felt. Well, then felt goes into making hats. So man as a hatter came from the felt industry, and it came from mercury poisoning. So people realized back then that mercury was an issue in their poisoning, and they, some of us decided, or some of them decided, that it certainly shouldn't be in your mouth. But there was two groups of dentists. One was barber dentists, which we know with the red stripe pole. And one of the advantages they had, they already had a chair that reclined, which is pretty cool, because dentistry is hard to do with a patient sitting in a chair. So if you got a chair that reclined, you already had a built-in advantage. You could not only cut their hair, you could probably let some blood, you could probably put a leech on something, and at the same time pull a tooth. Well, the, uh, again, I'm talking about the Van Hatters. The American Society of Dental Surgeons uh, made their members pledge they would not use amalgam. And they're the ones that set up the uh, Baltimore College of Dental uh, Surgery School, which still exists in Baltimore today, the first college dental school in the United States. And the interesting thing about this is that the, the American Society of uh, Dental Surgeons disbanded because the competition was so fierce they couldn't compete with the guys doing amalgam. Well, the guys doing amalgams were actually the ones that were called quacks by the American Society of Dental Surgeons because the German word for mercury is quacksilver. So originally, somebody who was not doing it the correct way was called a quack. And that's, they went on to form the ADA back, I think it was 1959 or something like, 1859, excuse me. So uh, today we look at a quack, somebody who's not doing it right back then, uh, that was somebody who used uh, mercury fillings. And the second amalgam war came along before World War II, and uh, a guy named uh, Alfred Stock, a German chemist and pharmacologist, he defined mercurialism uh, back in 1926 and recognized that amalgam fillings were a dangerous source of mercury exposure. Uh, the German Borsky, uh, Borinsky, I guess it is, he actually experimented on it himself, and uh, he would ingest mercury and then measure what came out in the urine and feces, and then he would, he would note how he felt during this time. 
So I can't imagine that being a very good thing to do today because this mercury, we know, stays in your body quite a long time. But he measured it and then categorized the different forms of mercurialism. So, and then they, they knew this wasn't good and they knew the mercury was coming from fillings at that time. So that controversy lasted a while until World War II and then in, Ger in Europe more important things developed so uh, the amalgam war was forgotten. And then in the well, 1980s, early 80s, a guy named Hal Huggins, I'm sure many of you heard Hal Huggins. I don't know if you've ever heard him speak. Uh, very, very delightful guy, very, very smart guy. Uh, he's kind of a pharaoh in the dental business in many areas because of his beliefs. Uh, he was one of the first guys to really get serious about uh, uh, mercury issues. And uh, if you ever get a chance to hear him, I welcome you to do that because he's getting old. Uh, but he's really a wealth of information and a very nice guy. He was at one of our um, exhibitor last time, so I hope he's here. If he's here, uh, please, please meet him. Uh, Matt Hansen, Swedish neurobiologist, in 82, explained mercury poisoning from the dental fillings. And then the IOMT developed in 1985. So since that time, I don't know if there's been a war, controversy, or a movement, but uh, we've been active and uh, we're still, you know, working right now to try to get amalgam out of, out of dentistry. So what is an amalgam filling? Well, many of us remember from dental school, it's approximately 50% mercury, 35% silver. These numbers vary a little bit by manufacturer. Tins 9% to expand uh, control expansion, and then copper. And the interesting thing about the copper, the high copper alloys actually increase mercury release by 50%. So the higher the copper alloy you're using, I think Titan's one of them. If nobody in here is using them, we don't have to worry about it. But um, that's been a, a problem because we thought we were doing a good thing. And of course, they contain it, uh, 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 just a trace of zinc. The chemistry in the FDA. When combining compounds, the compounds should be named based on the largest ingredient. Again, my controversy was the board, is that it's an amalgam filling. No, it's a mercury filling. It's 50% mercury. Why call it a silver filling? It's only 35% silver. So to me, it's a mercury filling, and that's what you'll usually hear them call it at the IOMT. Now, what are the benefits of mercury fillings? Well, we know that. Uh, you always hear when you talk to people, and again, um, I don't go to dental meetings. Um, I'm not a member of the, uh, the ADA uh, because of my beliefs. I mean, I, I don't want to be, I don't, Joe's a member. He, he's got their health insurance. It's his, his call. I chose not to be a member because uh, of their belief in amalgam and uh, of the people that we fight the hardest. Again, I don't want, fight's not probably the right, right word, but urge to change their views. The ADA is right at the top of the list, and I just don't want to, I don't want to benefit them by giving my dues. But it's been used for over 180 years, and when I go to dental meetings, that's always the same thing I hear. Well, you know, it's been used for 180, 200 years, whatever. You know, Abraham Lincoln had mercury filling. What's the big deal? Well, that's a hard one to argue about because, yeah, it has been used for a long time. Inexpensive? It is kind of inexpensive. But research we're doing now in the World Health Organization recently has come out and stated that exactly pretty much the same composite and amalgam as far as cost goes, when you consider the environmental cost of cleanup of amalgam mercury later on. So inexpensive, I question that. Relatively easy to use, no question about that. Drill the hole, put some varnish in there, put a band on, pack it in, carve it, and go. Uh, composites, as we know, to do them properly. It takes a little more technique. Uh, the technique has to be done more, you know, more, more particularly. Uh, you, you don't want to bone dry it, which we were taught in dental school in my days. That, dry the heck out of the tooth, desiccate it, put some varnish on it, pack the amalgam. Well, we know techniques on composites are a bit different. We could go on and on about how to do that. Uh, and it does re reduce chewing forces, even better than the tooth. I mean, a lot of times I see the tooth worn down, the amalgam still sticking up outside of the tooth. Uh, but we also know that thing called creep. Now, one of the things I say to patients is, and again, when they come in, we can talk about this tomorrow, but I don't tell anybody when they come in, God, you got to get your amalgams out. You've you got to get these out. And don't ever say that to anybody. <coughs> Excuse me. My patients come in. Half of them come from a good distance, and they might spend the night in a hotel, and we're going to do quadrant dentistry on them. The other half of my patients are just from Yakinville. They don't know anything else about dentistry. They just come in. I'm their dentist, and they get your teeth clean. They all get the same treatment. They all get exactly the same protocol. Um, some 
appreciate it differently than others. My patients that come a good distance come because they know me by uh, the international, or the IMT or the website or whatever. And these folks will seek you out. They will actually come find you if you're doing this right. And that's one of the important things about accreditation and or fellowship or mastership is the higher you are in the organization, the more sought out you are for, for patients to, to find you. So there's some economic benefits to this we'll talk about later too. But again, I'm not here to talk about make some money by doing this. You can make money by doing this, but that's not the purpose we're here, or that's not the reason we're here. Okay. No. And then the fundamentals of mercury. Okay. Again, dental school, long time ago. Well, undergraduate was even a longer time ago. Whew, I just turned 60 and last Friday. It's just, it, it's still hard to believe I've, I've got it. You know how your grandparents used to say, or your mother, oh, it'll go so quick, you won't even believe it. Well, four grandchildren and 60 and uh, busted up skiing and looking forward to surgery uh, in about another month or two. Uh, it, makes you, it makes you look back at the dental school days and undergraduate and, and realize how long ago that one we was. But at any rate, it's a heavy metal. We know that. Atomic number is 80. Uh, atomic weight is 200. That's not particularly important. It's just a heavy metal. Uh, one of the few metal, I don't know any other metal, it's a liquid at room temperature. Uh, aluminum isn't, steel isn't, molybdenum isn't, chrome isn't, but it is a liquid at room temperature. And I don't know many of us, boys are particularly bad about this. Kids, they would, they would get a mercury thermometer break it, play with the mercury, roll it around in their hands, watch it drop on the floor, you know, just do all kinds of goofy stuff with mercury. And uh, needless to say, we didn't realize we were absorbing the vapors. That it, what happened to it, if you left it out on the table there, it, tomorrow morning it wouldn't be there. It would vaporize. It would be gone. And where'd it go? It went into the air. We'll talk about some more of that later. Uh, it's odorless, colorless, tasteless. It vaporizes at 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And for every 50 degree increase in temperature, the vaporization pressure doubles. So at 60 degrees, it's got me, twice the vapor rate as it did at 10 degrees. And at body temperature, um, it's going to have, what, again, uh, more, more uh, uh, vaporization than it did at, at 60 degrees. Um, and very reactive. It oxidizes extremely easily. Oxidation means it loses electrons. It, it shares electrons with other compounds, particularly sulfur, one of its favorite things to attach onto. And every enzyme we have in our body is a sulfur group. In the different chemical forms, you have elemental mercury, which is merc metal uh, from either liquid or vapor, 80% of that. So in other words, when you're drilling this filling out and you're vaporizing this, now I don't know what temperature that filling gets to, but I don't care how much water you put on that, when that burr hits that mercury filling, it's going to increase the temperature of that metal. Vapor's coming off that filling, guaranteed. No question about it. And it fills the room, fills the patient's mouth. It fills your, your, you and your assistant sitting there. It's filling the area you're breathing in. So we're constantly being exposed to that. 80% of that's taken up in the blood. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, moderate uptake in the intestines, but not a big deal. The, the big deal with vaporized mercury is that it does immediately be absorbed through your nose, into your lungs, into your blood. Now, we know that also mercury will not remain in your blood for more than 48 hours. So a lot of patients, I ask them, they'll come in, have you had your mercury levels checked? Oh yeah, my doctor checked my blood. Well, if you, you haven't had anything done to your mouth, in, in, in other words, if there's no change in your mercury, there's not gonna be a change in your blood level. There won't be any mercury in your blood. You have to check either feces, or urine to find out the actual measure of the, you can't always, you can't tell anyway what the actual amount of mercury is in the body, uh, but there are tests you can do that uh, are challenge tests. The ones that most commonly are used is called a mercury challenge test or heavy metal challenge test. And we use DMPS or DMSA to, and I'll go into that later what they are, but um, you take these tablets and you wait for a while and you collect urine for a period. Some physicians want it for 12 hours, some want it for six. You take a sample of that and send it in, and then what that then will do, they'll come back with a panel, which we'll show later. Joe's got some information on that. that will actually show you how much heavy metal in relation came out with that urine. Again, it doesn't tell you how much is in the body. It just gives you bar graphs of how much came out in the urine. And that's probably one of the more accurate tests to determine how much the body burden is. And then what we do, we work with alternative physicians to help remove uh, the mercury. 
Uh, they've got different compounds. And again, don't we'll talk about that, but don't try to do this yourself. This is physician work. Uh, we just send the patients off to get it checked, and then the physicians do the rest of that. Um, inorganic mercury salt, formed by oxidation of mercury, again, loss of electrons, uptake in the intestine, uh, poor mobility, does not cross the blood brain barrier and causes inflammation in the gut. A lot of patients that we have with leaky gut syndrome, I don't know how many have heard of that, come back from the alternative position all the time, leaky gut. Well, we have compounds now we can give to absorb mercury in the gut. Um, Chris Shea's got a compound out that's very effective in, re in removing mercury from the stomach because mercury in the stomach increases yeast. And we know that if, if mercury is in the stomach, any bacteria is also resistant to antibiotics in the stomach. These people also have a problem with fibromyalgia. Uh, there's a whole host of symptoms. They come in and they've been everywhere to physicians. Nobody can fix them. They have gut issues. They have diarrhea. They've got Crohn's disease, a lot of things. Now, again, we don't, I'm not trying to be a physician here, but as a naturopath, I kind of have a little information and kind of can move people in direction knowing a little bit more about this. But it's, it's fairly simple for even a dentist to prescribe something um, for this. It's an, actually a, it's an antioxidant that works very effectively to get the uh, mercury out of the gut. Oh, I'm trying to think Chris's compound. Uh, Joe, you here? What? DMP or what is it? IMF? IMD? Oh, it's called IMD. Is Chris going to be here? Okay. Well, he's got a company called Quicksilver Scientific. Uh, you ever get a chance? He'll probably be here at the next meeting. Yeah. Quicksilver Scientific is the name of his company. He, on the, we can find them on the web. Wait a minute. I'll keep coming up with the same thing here. Oh, wait a minute. We're okay. Yeah. Methylmercury. All right. Methylmercury is formed bacteria. Uh, synthesis it starts in the mouth and in the gut. 95% uptake in the intestines, which is not good, and good mobility crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, in fish, it's methyl uh, mercury cysteine, which mimics methionine. And here's the other one that we're hearing a lot about, a lot of controversy about this. It's ethyl mercury, or thimerosal, which is a preservative in vaccines. Now, I don't know what the truth is, but you know, you do have to be careful what research you read. And we're all a little biased. Um, if you're conservative, you like to read conservative stuff. If you're liberal, you want liberal stuff. But whoever does the research on this really kind of determines what the answer is. But I remember back before 1980, uh, there was one in 6,500 births were autistic. Now the number, I think, is less than 160. Now, one in 6,500 versus one in 160 is quite a difference. And we can pinpoint the start of that back in 1983 when they demanded vaccines for children in school. Now, again, whether it's causing that or not, I'm not a research scientist, but ethyl mercury is not a good one. 100% absorbable, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and we're giving these vaccines, particularly to toddlers, you know, two and three years old. They're getting 10, 20 of these vaccines, but all contain mercury. Now, I know you can get this stuff without mercury now, and I would encourage you to do that. But there's still a lot of controversy. Some say absolutely no connection whatsoever. But to me, there's something fishy going on there. I don't get it. Say again? Vaccines? No autism, yeah. And it's 6 to 1 in male. So there's connection. And Boyd Haley has got a, some excellent lectures on this. Um, he's, it's 6 to 1 male. And it's a connection to testosterone. But, um, yeah, it's a real problem. If you know anybody with an autistic child, they get their hands full. And it's not, a, not easy. And the other thing is, the, the first child born uh, from the mother is the worst affected. And the theory is that that child chelated the mercury from her, so the first child gets the biggest dose. Second child's not as affected. Interesting. So, but uh, it's a problem for us. Two ionic forms of mercury. Mercurius, which has lost one electron. And again, this is just because you've got to take this test, okay? And mercuric, which has lost two electrons, so the two forms. 
Mercury shares electrons are a covalent bond very easily in the body. And as I mentioned earlier, it loves sulfur. Sulfur is also called thiol groups. Every enzyme in our body has sulfur. Every protein in our body is connected to sulfur. Methionine, cysteine, and cysteine are the uh, predominant amino acids. Mercury and its compounds, when mercury binds to an enzyme, the enzyme no longer functions. Now, you've got to remember, enzymes are, are catalysts to make a reaction happen. So, if you have a key that's supposed to fit in a keyhole, it goes in one way. You can't turn the key upside down or sideways and get it in that hole. It's got to go this certain way. Well, once mercury attaches to the sulfur on an enzyme, the shape changes, and it no longer fits the hole it was supposed to fit into that cell. So it no longer functions. Now, if you measure for that enzyme, the enzyme is still there. The measurement, the blood test would say, yeah, you've got plenty of thyroid hormone, not a problem, or whatever hormone it is. But it's not functioning. And the other problem is that that, that enzyme now becomes an antigen in the body. Instead of being an enzyme, now it's a reactive species that can cause other things to happen in the body. So that's the cascade here. And I'll go through here in a minute and show you how many atoms are in the smallest amount of mercury. Now, mercury is a heavy metal, we know, but um, let's see here. I think I'll back myself up here. Enzyme no longer functions. Okay. More than 99% of enzymes contain sulfur groups that mercury has a strong affinity to. Mercury will bind to sulfur groups and disrupt the function of the enzyme. So that's, that's the key here, is mercury binding to sulfur. Now, we all hear about, well, why aren't fish dying? You know, what's the big deal? They're swimming around the ocean, the ocean's full of mercury, the lake's full of mercury, blah, 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 and the fish seem to be fine. Well, they have a lot of selenium in them. Now, selenium has even stronger bond for mercury than sulfur. So once that selenium is bound to the mercury, it doesn't get in the fish's neural system, so it doesn't seem to affect them, but it's in the meat of that fish. Now, we used to think that was a big deal. Now, maybe it still is a big deal. I don't like eating a lot of mercury, but... Um, what we eat in our diet doesn't seem to be the biggest problem anymore. It's what's in our mouth. So, but understand that mercury binds to selenium, making it useless. Now, selenium is also an antioxidant that protects us against cancer. But once it binds to mercury, it's no longer useful for that purpose. Now, it's nice that it bound to mercury, but you're not being protected from cancer from it any longer. Talk about toxicity of mercury. Okay, we got a graph here. I'm going to list several things. And as you can see, the top of the list is what is the most toxic of this group? It's mercury. Mercury is the most toxic material outside of plutonium. That's pretty interesting. We know plutonium is pretty nasty stuff, but it's more toxic than cadmium. Look at arsenic. We have all these people poisoning with arsenic, Blanche Taylor Moore. You ever heard of her? Lady that ran around North Carolina. I think she poisoned three husbands before they, they got her. Uh, and look at lead. Whew, we took lead out of, the, out of paint. We took lead out of gasoline. That was a killer. You can't even have, you can't have leaded paint in a house anymore. You can't even paint over it. You've got to take it all out. You've got to burn it off the wood or whatever you've got to do. And then you've got to get off the sides of the house, all this stuff. And look at there. It's on the bottom of the list as far as these metals. We're less concerned about mercury than we are about lead. And understand, too, that we're the only industry that doesn't regulate mercury. OSHA doesn't care how much our mercury levels are in our office. I mean, you can't, you can't have a light bulb factory and not have OSHA inspectors in there inspecting your, your mercury level. Uh, you can't have a switch or, a, you know, a mercury switch factory and, and not have OSHA protecting the employees from the mercury level. But they don't seem to care a thing about dentistry or assistants or the dentist or the front desk or the hygienist. I don't get that, but that seems to be the case. Okay, again, mercury is the most, non, most poisonous, non-radioactive material occurring on the planet. There is no safe or harmless level of mercury. Just one atom of mercury is harmful to the body. Now, one atom may only mess up one enzyme, but, you know, that's not the biggest thing in the world, but the, these, a little bit of mercury has a whole lot of atoms. Amalgam filling continues to release poisonous mercury vapor. That's the thing. Every time you brush, every time you uh, grind your teeth, every time you drink hot fluids, um, every time you brush, as I said, uh, you're releasing mercury from these fillings. And as you inhale, you absorb it. As you exhale, your family absorbs it. 
So it's constantly going in and going out, going in and going out. At the end of that cycle, 10, 15, 20 years, the mercury filling breaks up, falls out, and oftentimes is replaced with another one if it hasn't already split the tooth, which comes to another interesting thing. I don't, people come in, I'm, I started on this earlier, I don't tell anybody, you've got to get your mercury fillings out. That's never my conversation. People come in and tell me they want them out. I said, fine, I can do that. We sit down, design on lays, on uh, inlays and composites to do that, and how we're going to do it. But what I do tell people is, and I have in, in the roll cameras, I'm sure you've got those, and show them all the cracks and all the fractures in that tooth. I've never seen a mercury filling in a tooth without a fracture. It, they, it's going to happen. It expands 10 times more than the tooth. It contracts 10 times more than the tooth. Sooner or later, it's going to break the tooth, requiring a root canal or a crown. I mean, that's, that's the given. So why a dentist would want to sit around and wait for that to happen is a little quizzical to me. But uh, that's even a different health issue. But it's, it's something we're supposed to be preventing. And here we were placing the material. So that's my conversation with the patient. Now, some patients come in more informed than I am. And that used to piss me off. Good grief. You know, one thing worse than having somebody else know more about what you're doing than you do. And uh, my ego would get in my way a lot early on. And you'd get, get, get offensive, you know, like, what the heck is another, another kook? Until I realized these kooks were really a big part of my practice. I love kooks today. The weirder, the better. They take a lot of time. They, the interviews, Joe, I'll talk about that. I mean, they're in there sometimes two hours. I'm going, what in the world are you talking about? Terry go, well, she wanted to see these pictures again. I was like, my God. You know, but, you know, that's okay. we got to get two other rooms to work at it. We'll just sit over there and do that. And once they get done, I mean, they're ready to rock and roll, and we do a lot of dentistry on them. But uh, they, they don't tell them anything about No, and Again, as I'm starting to say, if they're interested in the health issues of this, I will talk to them about it. I'm not going to say your fibromyalgia is going to get better, your MS is going to get better, or anything. You can't say any of that. You know that. But what I can say is that when we're done, your mouth's going to look great, it's going to be stronger, it's going to feel good, and it's going to last a long time. You know, boom. And I hope you feel better. And usually they do, but yeah, that, that's the work of the physician because, yes, ma'am. The tooth hurts afterwards? Mm -mm. Very, very rarely. No. Um, well, yeah, we occasionally have root canals and have to deal with that. That's a different issue. Yeah, well, we, again, the root canals and the IOMT, there's, there's some of us who don't do any of them. There's some of us who do them. There's some of us who use um, Endocal. Um, there's, we've got all different ways of doing that. I happen to be... Uh, an advocate of ozone therapy, so I'm going to use ozone, and again, that's a different course. Um, and I use Endocal, and just I've got a whole different regimen how I do that. I use a lot of ozone in my office, and I use a lot of, Joe and I would use different cocktails. We'll inject vitamin B12, folic acid, um, different things, procaine to get stimulation. I'm going to use uh, an acupuncture machine to actually get more stimulation and drainage in an area for a root canal. Uh, stuff that works and helps people a bunch, uh, but composite sensitivity, nah, I'm not, Excuse I'm, me, I'm not, excuse me, Bill, because we're taping this, if we could leave the questions till the end, and then we can get a mic to the person so it'll be more valuable when you review it. Yeah, so we don't know what the questions are, so it doesn't make any sense. Okay, thanks. Good, good, thank you. Okay, I'll be happy to answer that, but my boss said, you know, move on. Okay. Um, okay, amalgams continue to release poisonous mercury vapor. Any form of stimulation that heats an amalgam will increase the release of mercury vapor. Brushing, grinding, chewing, hot coffee, whatever it is. And this is from the World Health Organization. Amalgam fillings are the single greatest source of mercury exposure. Now, again, a year ago, I was concerned about eating tuna. You know, I still have a little bit. I mean, I'm not a big fish eater anyway, but I love raw tuna. But I was thinking, God, I don't want to be in a dental business and eat tuna, but uh, what we eat is such a small amount of mercury that we get compared to what's in our mouths. I have no amalgam fillings, but if I did, I'd be more concerned about those. Um, amalgam fillings continually release mercury vapor. We know that. The ADA has admitted that. They used to say, nah, it doesn't come off of there. The 
It's been measured. Your own mercury analyzers have measured the mercury coming off. We know it comes out every breath. If you've got a mercury filling, I'll show you some information in a minute on that. <clears throat> and, it, and the first uh, exposure can come from the mother. It goes through the blood-brain barrier. You're exposing your children, the fetus, even way before they're ever born, if you have mercury fillings or work in a mercury environment. Mercury passes through the placenta, as I said, to the fetus and through the breast milk to the nursing baby. We never take mercury fillings out of a pregnant lady or a nursing lady. I don't care. Unless it's some sort of emergency where she's got you know, a toothache or a, you know, an abscess tooth, I've got to do something. We're going to do everything we can to treat that one tooth with all our precautions, but I would not sit down and do a quadrum of amalgams on a lady that's nursing or, or, or going to have a baby. You just, just don't do it. Now, you know, the other thing about that is you don't know what the uh, implications would be if that child were to be born with a problem, that mother could come back and potentially sue you for doing that, too. Uh, even though mercury is perfectly safe for us, we know that. But uh, there could be a problem with that. Dr. McMillan, how do you say? Well, and again, it, this is one of those things that it, chronic mercury poisoning can directly and indirectly contribute to the increase in risk and severity of every known disease and health issue. And again, it's being blamed on a little bit of everything. And I don't know which, what it actually does or doesn't do entirely. I'm not a scientist, I'm a dentist. Um, I do this kind of a for fun on the side. This information, Joe and I did not do the research on. We actually stole it from researchers. All right, this is a little chart just to kind of give you a, a road down on measurement, unit of measure. One ounce is 28 grams, okay, pretty easy to follow. One gram is 1,000 milligrams, mg. One milligram is 1,000 micrograms with a little ug, okay. Now, it's getting pretty small. One atom of mercury, oh, excuse me, atoms of mercury in a microgram, okay? How many atoms of mercury are in one millionth of a gram of mercury is four trillion. Again, there's four trillion atoms in one microgram, which is one millionth of, of an a gram, and every one of those atoms can disrupt an enzyme system, an enzyme itself making it non-functional. So, you know, we're not talking about a big load there, and we're talking about this amount of mercury easily is absorbed every day in your body if you have mouth mercury fillings. Now here's a, um, whoops, excuse me, I'm going to pass that. This is a uh, micrograph of the actual surface of the amalgam filling. And what this is showing here, I'll turn around and this, this is actually um, mercury that's not been deposited in the amalgam surface itself. This is amalgam. Here's the surface of the amalgam. <coughs> These are kind of bubbles of mercury, and you can see this is liquid mercury. So as this amalgam surface wears down, these undistributed or undissolved mercury bubbles are actually just exposing themselves and off-gassing into the mouth. So that's how it gets out of there. People would say it's trapped in there. It doesn't come out. It's like sodium chloride. I had one dentist come on. Good guy. Oh, well, used to be a friend of mine. Um, well, we're colleagues. Is that, that's a nice way. Um, he gave me that analogy of sodium chloride. That's just good grief. I, should, I wish he'd come here. But at any rate, that's, that's what a, a surface of amalgam looks like. Now, here's a study. Now, this is done a long time ago. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still standing. Um, this is unstimulated amalgam. Now you can see this was done in 1979, 84, and 85. So this, the, the longevity of this, the fact that it's been done so long isn't necessarily unimportant. I think it's important in that even back then people were looking at this. Now, the variations in the height of these blue lines are not only uh, testing methods, but they really didn't write down how many amalgam fillings each one of these people had because you've got three different researchers here. So these bar graphs are different but they're all relative in the sense that unstimulate, meaning I'm not chewing, I'm not brushing, I'm not bruxing. This is the Jerome indicator. They're measuring the amount of mercury that you're exhaling from your fillings, okay? So you can see the bar graph. The numbers aren't particularly important, but I think the, the bar graph shows the, uh, shows the reality there. Oops, excuse me, went too far. Okay, uh, and this is, that was per breath. Back up here. See, it says per breath. Ah, I'm going the wrong way on this thing. 
One more time. There we go. And this is per day. No, wait a minute. excuse me a second. I got to get this right. I can't get my finger. Okay, now I'm out. Okay. Uh, and this is per day. Again, the numbers aren't particularly important here, but you can see the amount of mercury that is being absorbed. And here we go. Stimulated. Now, you can see what stimulation means. After 15 minutes in the Gay study, three in Abraham and one in the Patterson study, you can see how much. Now, the green bar down there is unstimulated. That means we're not chewing. We're not doing anything. So you can see the difference in how much more mercury is released after the amalgam is stimulated. And this is uh, how much per day, again, but pretty significant differences there. And then we come to this chart which shows someone who is chewing for 30 minutes and stops chewing. You can see how the graph starts down here at a pretty low level. Okay, this is where we start chewing. Rises, 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 gets up here. Okay, we stop chewing. Okay, look at 30 minutes. For another 30 minutes, we're still off-gassing mercury at a pretty significant rate, much higher than when we started. So we've got at least, you might want to extend this out, 90 minutes of stimulation from once we start with that mercury coming off these fillings. Okay, back in, uh, in 03, which is a long time ago, the EPA came out and said we need 4.8 uh, micrograms uh, per day for non-occupationally non non exposed. U.S. Department of Health and uh, Human Services said 3.2. These numbers are all over the place. Uh, we know we just came out with a new fluoride level of, what, 0.7 arbitrarily set. Uh, there is no safe level of fluoride. There's no level of fluoride we need in our body. But somebody decided, well, I think it was 0.2, wasn't it, when we were in school, Joe? Something like that? No, 2. Yeah, <laughs> and now it's 0.7. I, because of modeled enamel, it came down so much. Some, some genius decided that would be the amount, I guess. Uh, so these, these numbers there, look at Canada, much more conservative, uh, 0.8. This is just recommended amounts for people uh, that, that, that should not have exposure. The daily exposure of amalgam, according to the World Health Organization, is between 3 and 17 micrograms, with 10 micrograms being the average uh, uh, exposure per day. And Mark Richardson did some research on this, who's a member of this organization, really, really smart guy. Maximum allowable levels of mercury vapor, OSHA, time weight average, 40 hour a week. Again, this is occupational exposure, 50 micrograms per cubic meter. EPA, US, and Australia come out with 0.3. These are still, EPA and OSHA are still United States government organizations. I don't know why the difference is. And, uh, this was backed up and research was done in, in 11. So this, it, it, according to these numbers and these organizations, if you have, let's say, six fillings in your mouth, uh, well, I don't know how many surfaces that is, let's say 12 surfaces, I don't know, maybe it's six surfaces, OSHA, you're exceeding it twice as much, and with EPA standards, you're 400 times over. If you open a mixed amalgam capsule, I guess those little titrated things, anybody still have titrators? Do you have one? Keep it. It's probably be worth something someday. I don't know what happened to mine. Uh, opening a mixed amalgam capsule uh, 20 times ocean, 3,300 times EPA, and again, drilling amalgam fillings out 80 times from ocean, 13,000 times a, mal a maximum allowable limit, uh, according to the EPA. And what the main thing to me is, too, again, I mentioned, why aren't these things being looked at by the ocean EPA and dental offices? They, nobody seems to care but us. We're getting into that. We're, the the IOT is moving in that direction. Uh, Matt Young, our past president, has done some amazing work. He was just down in Orlando last weekend with Joe and, and Fair and Kim uh, at the, what was the name of that group, Joe? The educators? Yeah, there are people who educate dental students in the, the universities. <laughs> you said it was 2,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell them what you told me. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, they don't have a clue about this stuff, and they don't want to. They don't want to know. You know. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
uh, Matt Young is going to have a breakout session tomorrow afternoon, which I really encourage you to go. I wouldn't if it was going to interfere with Joe and I's session, but it's not going to. I'd keep it a secret if it would. But uh, he's going to present his 50-minute uh, speech that's been taped uh, tomorrow afternoon. So I really encourage you to come listen to that. It's really, really, I mean, it's going to be great. I haven't heard it yet, but knowing Matt, it's going to be wonderful. Okay, and here again, we were talking about food earlier. Uh, in 1991, the World Health, or Health Organization came out and said amalgam is the greatest source of mercury burden in the occupationally exposed population. It's not food. It's not the air. Again, I, I'd like to see mercury removed from coal power plants, and I don't want mercury in my environment. But what, what's in our mouth is the biggest burden of mercury, not, not what we eat. Uh, Health Canada, maximum tolerable daily intake of mercury would be reached with four average sized fillings, which is eight surfaces, must be MOs and DOs, uh, for a 154 pound person. Uh, that must mean I can have like 12 fillings, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm in pretty good shape there. All right. And sources of mercury exposure. Um, again, this is the, the World Health Organization. And uh, this is, look at the amalgam. Now, look at the bar graph. Again, the numbers on the right aren't as important as you can see where fish is, and that's what we're all up in arms about. Non-fish foods, I guess non-fish foods probably come in with insecticides and stuff like that. Uh, air, if you live downstream of a, uh, or a coal-fired plant, and then, of course, water. Interesting, too, about water, um, it takes half a gram of water to pollute a 10-acre lake. That's a half a gram. Now, there's usually a gram of mercury in a filling. Let me free you. There's a gram of mercury in a filling. Half a gram of mercury pollutes a 10-acre lake. That's kind of strange. Isn't it? You can't eat the fish out of that lake if there's that much mercury in the water. But it's okay for us to run around with it in our mouth. Mercury absorption, this gets back to uh, the, the form of mercury, uh, metallic, ingested. It, it passes right on through. The little metal scraps, the mercury scraps that you don't catch with your dam or the vacuum or the clean out, they're going to go right on through the patient. Very, very little worry about absorption of any kind of mercury from that. It, it's not an issue. Um, inorganic mercury, less than 25%. Inhaled mercury vapor coming off that filling you're grinding out, 80% of that's being absorbed either through the buccal mucosa or the, the, the palate or the breathing. So that's what we do. We're, Joe's going to show you how we protect the patient from all these different areas. Uh, ingested methylmercury. Uh, bad actor, you, you're looking at 95 to 100 percent absorption. Richards, Mark Richardson, another good guy. It was determined that some 67 million Americans would exceed the mercury dose associated with the reference dose of 0.3. That was the EPA recommended, established by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1995. So. 67 million Americans are over the EPA limit uh, in 19, I guess that was 2010 when he did that study. Okay, this is a, let's see. This must be a new slide, you know. Did you make this up for me? <laughs> He'll say he's my slide guy. He probably he's got an apple and I got a PC. And when he sends me stuff, it, it, sometimes one slides on top of the other. <laughs> I think he does it to me on purpose. Okay, I don't know what we're saying here. Community risk assessment and joint toxicity: mercury vapor, methyl mercury, and lead. Concurrent exposure to lead, methyl mercury, and mercury does does current U.S. Po a large population, a third of the U.S. population, is currently exposed to mercury. That's uh, the mercury vapor, methylmercury, and lead on a daily basis. Say again? I'm not following you. Why it was done? Oh, okay. So it was done in 2010. All right, now here's the directions on the spursaloy. Uh, that's, well, that goes back a long time. Uh, I used the spursaloy in Indiana, I think, back in 79. That was before, was it Titan? Is that the other name of mercury fillings? Okay, 
You can't use it in expectant mother. Now this is 1975, I'll bet, at least. Can't use it in expectant mothers, children under six. Proximal occlusal contact to the similar metal restorations, duh. Patients with severe renal deficiency, patients with known allergies to mercury. Lady us we spoke to at lunch has a mercury allergy. Estimated three to eight percent, somewhere around five percent of Americans have an actual mercury exposure or a reaction. One dental school tested their students and found it was as high as 30 percent had mercury uh, allergies. <clears throat> patients with known allergies to mercury for retrograde or endodontic filling material. How often do you see people come in? with a uh, uh, apicoectomy with a mercury filling stuck in the end of the tooth. I mean, it just happens all the time. I don't recommend apicos anymore at all, but we still have a lot of patients with those things. Uh, and it says right on the label, don't do it. As a filling material for cast crowns, which means, I guess, a, a, a buildup. Now, all the time taking off, you know, mercury, gold crowns with mercury underneath them. Patients come in, <coughs> they ask me, they said, look, I, I, they obviously got mercury fillings and they got gold crowns. It looked good. I mean. Some of this dentistry is beautiful, but there'll be mercury underneath. They ask me, what do you think? Well, I'll check them with a reader meter, which is an electrical meter that uh, Hal Huggins recommends, and I can usually tell if there's mercury under that. Or you can see the radiograph. Maybe you can see a jagged line under it. But I'll tell you what, I just tell folks, look, let's get the obvious out, and then if your symptoms don't improve or if you want to go further, we'll, do, we'll take the you know, gold crowns off. Oftentimes they do. 90% of the time there's mercury under there. It's, it's amazing. But uh, we... we we're taught not to do that in dental school, and it's done all the time. This is some, uh, some pictures of Joe's work. Uh, this bridge didn't work out, but he did a nice job. Look, the margin is not that wide, really, Joe. So it's, it's better than some of his stuff, you know. <laughs> but the gold, I like the color of the gold. Um, but, you know, we, we see this all the time where mercury filling is packed in and around a, a gold crown. And we, we know that we've got galvanic reactions going on there that shouldn't be done. It usually does. <laughs> he usually forgets his wallet right around dinner time. It never fails. And this is a, I went to Indiana and Ralph Phillips, he was worse than I am. I, we, he always had dental materials right after lunch. <laughs> it was just god awful. This guy was the most boring speaker I have ever heard in my life. Very, very smart guy. But this is our next slide and we're going to talk about mercury and its expansion. Like, good grief. So Ralph Phillips, back in, uh, in 1964, uh, restorations, don't put them in direct contact with a gold crown. We know dissimilar metals cause a battery. You're not supposed to do that. Still being done. Uh, mercury in tooth roots and jaw bones. Fourfold increase in the amount of mercury per gram of tissue weight of dentin when a gold crown is placed up, meaning the mercury is actually going into the tissue, absorbed into the bone, amalgam tattoos. Used to think the Malcolm tattoos were caused by that spinning bird was throwing that mercury or that silver into the tissue. That's not what causes mercury tattoos. It's the galv galvanic reactions. And that's, that's a deposit of mercury. It ought to be removed. If I send them to the surgeon, have them cut out. I don't do that. I don't like surgery. I don't extract teeth. I'll extract a tooth if it's wiggling, but I just don't care for surgery. I'd rather, I'd rather do on lays and fun stuff like that. Kept currents in the oral cavity and measured microamps. Microamp is a millionth of an amp. The brain acts on billionths of an amp. Nanoman. So what's in your mouth can override by many, many times the, the, the electrical activity in the brain. So what's these galvanic reactions? I think it was a Lucille Ball one time that was on Johnny Carson. Anybody remember that? She reported that she gets, here's radio stations in her head. And everybody laughed and thought it was crazy. Well, there's a lot of folks I've had come in with a snut, not every day, but have come in with the same type of report because of that galvanic action in their mouth. They've got a gold crown up here of one kind of alloy, something else down here, different kind of alloys all over their mouth, and that tremendous galvanic reaction. I'm sorry, this is fine here. Okay, I'm sorry. The brain, uh, nanoamps, okay, amalgam, a thousand times, yeah, okay. So at any rate, a thousand times more uh, electrical power in the mouth than in the brain, easily overriding the brain. Uh, that's why some of us, I know Carl McMillan and I know Joe are doing the, uh, 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 what's the name of the implant, Carl? Yeah, to uh, overcome 
the electrical, they're, they're not doing the metal implants. So I commend them for that because that's another issue. People come in and say, what would you have, an implant or a bridge? Well, if I can do a bridge, I'm going to do a bridge. You know, that's just what I would rather have than the implant. But uh, titanium pegs in the head might not be the best thing overall for us. I don't know if there's any research out there showing that, but I'm sure that no one's going to volunteer to do that uh, if they're making implants. Uh, okay, this is MSDS again. Findings are extremely variable and includes Hermer shakes. Now this is, again, you can get everything in the world that mercury causes. Uh, excess salivation, stomatitis, loosening of teeth, blue lines on the gums, which is amalgam tattoos. Pain and numbness in the extremities, multiple sclerosis symptoms, again, uh, Lou Gehrig's also nephritis, um, uh, diarrhea, anxiety, headache, weight loss, anxiety, anorexia, mental depression, insomnia, irritability, instability, hallucinations, evidence of mental deterioration, Alzheimer's-like symptoms. It is a whole basket of stuff. And I guess mercury just affects a lot of people differently. That's just the bottom line. And, it, and it's one of those things that, you know, some of us get poison ivy and some of us don't. So what about a mixed amalgam? This is an interesting uh, case here. The, back in uh, 2006, um, I guess this, I don't know if the, how this whole thing happened, but this Barnes guy was sued by the patient, or the patient sued Barnes, or well, I don't know what the heck. But at any rate, the Sixth Circuit Court declared, based on the testimony from Kerr, which is mixed amalgam fillings, that amalgam and pure mercury are equally hazardous, therefore a separate MSDS sheet is not needed for amalgam. So if you have an MSDS sheet for mercury, it is the same as the amalgam fillings, which to me says a lot. Uh, it says that's a pretty bad actor. You, you, you would hope that the curve would have wanted a separate sheet so that they could prove that maybe with the silver and the tin, uh, the amalgam wasn't quite as toxic as the uh, amalgam, uh, or mercury, as the mercury, but they, they, didn't, they didn't want to do that, I guess. At any rate. Okay, mercury, and we got some cool films coming up here, if I can play them. Mercury vapor inhalation inhibits the binding of uh, GTP to tubulin in rat brain. Um, and this was done in Calgary, similarity of a molecular lesion in Alzheimer's disease. Dental silver tooth fillings, a source of mercury exposure revealed by whole body image scan and tissue analysis. So we got two films that are really cool to watch. Joe, you might have to help me do this. Whole body image distribution of mercury released from, again, this is another study we're going to show you. Okay, uh, so effects on mercury. All right. Demyelinization, mercury demyelinates the sheath of the nerve fibers and lead to diseases such as multiple sclerosis, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, mental illness, and depression. Here we go. How mercury causes brain neuron degeneration. Mercury has long been known to be a potent neurotoxic substance, whether it is inhaled or consumed in the diet as a food contaminant. Over the past 15 years, medical research laboratories have established that dental amalgam tooth fillings are a major contributor to mercury body burden. In 1997, a team of research scientists demonstrated that mercury vapor inhalation by animals produced a molecular lesion in brain protein metabolism, which was similar to a lesion seen in 80% of Alzheimer's diseased brains. Recently completed experiments by scientists at the University of Calgary's Faculty of Medicine now reveal, with direct visual evidence from brain neuron tissue cultures, how mercury ions actually alter the cell membrane structure of developing neurons. To better understand mercury's effect on the brain, let us first illustrate what brain neurons look like and how they grow. In this animation, we see three brain neurons growing in a tissue culture, each with a central cell body and numerous neurite processes. At the end of each neurite is a growth cone where structural proteins are assembled to form the cell membrane. Two principal proteins involved in growth cone function are actin, which is responsible for the pulsating motion seen here, and tubulin, a major structural component of the neurite membrane. During normal cell growth, Tubulin molecules link together end to end to form microtubules, which surround neurofibrils, another structural protein component of the neuronal axon. Shown here is the neurite of a live neuron isolated from snail brain tissue, displaying linear growth due to growth cone activity. 
It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. In contrast, other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. To understand how mercury causes this degeneration, let us return to our illustration. As mentioned before, Tubulin proteins link together during normal cell growth to form the microtubules which support the neurite structure. When mercury ions are introduced into the culture medium, they infiltrate the cell and bind themselves to newly synthesized tubulin molecules. More specifically, the mercury ions attach themselves to the binding site reserved for guanosine triphosphate, or GTP, on the beta subunit of the affected tubulin molecules. Since bound GTP normally provides the energy which allows tubulin molecules to attach to one another, mercury ions bound to these sites prevent tubulin proteins from linking together. Consequently, the neurite's microtubules begin to disassemble into free tubulin molecules, leaving the neurite stripped of its supporting structure. Ultimately, both the developing neurite and its growth cone collapse and some denuded neurofibrils form aggregates or tangles, as depicted here. Shown here is a neurite growth cone stained specifically for tubulin and actin, before and after mercury exposure. Note that the mercury has caused disintegration of tubulin microtubule structure. These new findings reveal important visual evidence as to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. More importantly, this study provides the first direct evidence that low-level mercury exposure is indeed a precipitating factor that can initiate this neurodegenerative process within the brain. Interesting. All right. Here's another study done by Vinnie Mary, and this is done a while back too, but doesn't change the, the, the truth of the experiment. What Vinnie did at University of Calgary, in an effort to show how mercury is deposited in the body, uh, he couldn't find any human subjects, so he decided he'd use sheep. So what he did is he created with the, the, the university a radioactive isotope of mercury, which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. You want radioactive isotope of mercury, you have to make it. So he did, and what he did, he made used that mercury to make his amalgam. And then what they put, they put uh, uh, the, the molars of the sheep, they filled them with mercury fillings, and let that sheep go on for 28 days like that. And then what they did at the end of 28 days, sacrificed the sheep, and they cut the mercury, the crowns off the teeth, so that the, the mercury fillings themselves wouldn't be part of of what you're seeing here in the scan. But what they did then, they scanned these animals, and you can see that at the, uh, at the, the jaw, this is a, the jaw up here of the mouth, you can see there's mercury in the, in the tissue. But also, importantly, here's stomach. Uh, I think these are the kidneys. Uh, this is a second stomach, and I think this might be the liver here, the next, well here it says right here, A, stomach, three stomachs. B is kidneys. See, John, yeah, D is the liver. So you can see the mercury concentration of this animal with 28 days of mercury fillings in their mouth. Well, when he did that study, again, there's another thing you can see a little more graphically and it measure how much mercury went in there. They also did a study with the uh, uh, pregnant sheep, and they did the same thing to them, and they sacrificed the sheep. But they also went in, and they found that after two days, the fetus had... Uh, mercury in the uh, uh, the neural tissues, so or, or the amniotic fluid. It was already uh, mercury had got through the blood-brain barrier, and when they sacrificed the sheep, they also found that the highest concentrations of the the fetus was in the uh, pituitary and uh, in the kidneys. 
So, but this wasn't good enough because I think the, uh, the folks who uh, boohooed this research said, well, you know, sheep don't eat like people do, so therefore they kind of chew their food, their cud or whatever, and they grinders or rumifores or rumiflank. Or, or, anyway, uh, they don't eat like we do, so this study really isn't valid. So he said, okay, let's do it on a monkey. So they did the same thing on a monkey, as you can see here. The, uh, again, the, the, the kidneys, the intestine, you know, you can see where you can't see the head up here or the mouth, but you can see that the mercury is scattered throughout the body. We're the biggest in the intestine and the kidneys, uh, which would also include the liver. And again, this study was looked at like, well, you, you're crazy. You know, mercury, uh, and monkeys aren't the same as people. But you can see how much mercury gets out in that body after just 28 days. And this is another little study that was done. Uh, we placed, I didn't have part of this. It was done before I got here, but uh, when actually it wasn't, but I had no part of it. Um, it's just a plexiglass model with 10 holes in it, drop of uh, spilled mercury placed in distilled water. And they just let that room sit. <clears throat> it's a general mixing. One millimeter sample was analyzed, and uh, they found that the, you know, it had 4 to 22 micrograms per day of mercury coming out of that, that amalgam clump in the distilled water, showing again that mercury is constantly coming off uh, of an amalgam uh, clump particle, whatever you want to call it, filling. Okay. Both the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and National Academy of Science state that between 8 and 10 percent of American women have mercury levels that would render any child they give birth to neurologic disorders. Okay, we talked about autism earlier. Mercury in fish has already re reacted with proteins and other protective molecules. This bound mercury, methyl mercury, is not as toxic as an equal amount of pure equivalent. Fish bound mercury selenium we talked about before makes it safer for us to eat. Uh, it has stronger uh, bond to selenium than it does the thiol groups, which is the sulfur groups. As a study done by Perinundi, uh, who lectures with us quite often, brilliant guy. Uh, transitional heavy metals attach to lipids in the endothelial of the blood vessels, altering lipid signaling medicate mediators. Prostaglandins are released, causing inflammation and tears in the membrane. Plaque forms to repair the damage. In other words, we could be looking at atherosclerotic plaques. We could be looking at uh, 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 coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis. Maybe the problem is just as Perinundi is saying, that we're forming sclerotic plaques in the arterial walls, which then have to heal, and cholesterol comes in to heal those. A similar study um, is done by uh, Levy several years ago. His theory is that uh, uh, atherosclerosis is caused by a lack of vitamin C. It's localized scurvy. And again, you get a breakdown of the endothelial lining of the lumen of that artery. And then when, as cholesterol comes in to heal it, things attach to it and, and grow. We also know uh, from parallel disease that the you know, perio will grow in those, uh, those plaques also. So we know that whatever's in the mouth is throughout the body. And uh, mercury causes cytotoxicity in the vascular epithelium. And methyl mercury causes mitochondrial damage. Why does dentists think mercury is safe? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, it's, again, I don't want to make anybody wrong here. Uh, but, you know, I guess it's because we've been taught that in our dental schools. We trust our dental schools. We send money to our dental schools. We're alumni of them. Uh, you know, I happen to like IU because I went there. You know, you guys like Carolina or, I don't know, wherever you went to school, we always have a kind of a, uh, an affinity for that. And uh, I don't know. Uh, it's just we tend, to, we tend to believe what we're taught. All right. Why aren't we all dead? All right, here's an interesting thing. There is a couple proteins that are uh, present in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and in the brain tissues, and they are called alleoprotein E's, and there's three kinds, two, three, and four. What these are, these are basically housekeeping proteins that transport cholesterol. And research has been done on these, and it's been found that you can do test, test these, and you have a marker for how likely you are to get Alzheimer's disease, um, which my mother just passed away June from it. My father didn't, so maybe I've got a 50-50 chance. I haven't been tested. I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> See, that was one of those things. Uh, but anyway, uh, what it is, there's a uh, protein 4. You have re reduced mercury toxicity. In other words, there's, there's 
three kinds, alleoprotein 2, 3, and 4. If you got type 2, you, you're a winner because you have a very, very low risk of having any Alzheimer's disease. And with that protein, you have two cysteine molecules on it, which two cysteine molecules are two sources of sulfur which can grab mercury and get it out of the body, your excreter. You're not holding the mercury. It's either coming out in your hair, your feces, your sweat, your breath, your, your urine. It's coming out of the body. If you're type 3, you have a moderate chance of having Alzheimer's disease, and that means you have an arginine and a cysteine. So you've got one sulfur molecule on that protein. If you're type 4, you're cooked. You've got a good chance of having Alzheimer's and you have very little chance of getting mercury out of your body. So what looks like you're saying is that the less chance we have of eliminating mercury, the higher the chance we have of getting Alzheimer's disease. So the more mercury coming out of your body, the better. You know, when people do hair tests and they go, gee, I didn't have any mercury in my hair. That's, just, that's sad. I want mercury in my hair because it's telling me the mercury is coming out of my body, not staying in it. We want to be secreting it, not holding it. So this was a test done to determine uh, the likelihood of Alzheimer's, but also the likelihood of you're not having a lot of mercury in your body. And again, low hair mercury in autistic children. Interesting, they're holding on to the mercury. They're not getting it out. They also have a lot of problems with their gut, like Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. So perhaps, I don't know, these children have mercury in their gut. I don't know. It seems pretty simple if that were the case to fix it, but there is a connection somehow between the mercury and, and these diseases, we think. And uh, you also have this 90-year-old patient, and we see them all the time, somebody who's smoked all their life, never gets lung cancer. These guys come in, the women come in, and they've got a mouthful of mercury fillings. They're 90 years old, healthy as can be, you know? They don't have a problem in the world. Well, they're probably good secretors. They're probably an alleoprotein, too, that gets rid of this mercury. It's coming out of their body, and that's good. That's what we want. Heavy metal synergy, what happens when you combine mercury and lead? Well, le le lethal dose equals one of mercury, which means if you have one ounce of mercury is going to kill you, let's say, and one ounce of lead is going to kill you, if you put them together, combined effects, toxicity, a rapid systemic testing procedure, uh, what happens is when you combine one LD of mercury and one LD of lead, it's 100 times more toxic. So what's that saying is this. If you have lead in your body, which we all do. If, you, if you're drinking fluorinated water, you have lead in your body. Uh, fluoride and lead and arsenic and mercury and all that good stuff comes in with that fluoride. Uh, you have 100 times more toxic effect than if you had one or the other. Were you not hearing me? Okay. Oh, we have this all the time. Biological responses after amalgam removal. Mercury has a time-dose relationship. Uh, it's not stable. We know it's a battery. It's constantly off-gassing mercury and reacting with other metals in the body and in the mouth. Uh, people respond in one of five ways. They have no health changes whatsoever, which means I got the mercury out of their body, but, or excuse me, out of their mouth. I don't have it out of their body. My job is not to get it out of the body. It's to get it out of the mouth. So they need to go to an alternative position, get chelated, and get the heavy metals out of their body. Uh, the problems are worse. Well, if that's the case, then I did a poor job or of, of protecting that patient while I'm removing the mercury, or these people are just so sick that any little bit of extra mercury makes them sicker. A lot of people are like that. I'll talk to them, they'll go, oh my God, I was sick for two weeks. I'm sorry. You know, it's like, I feel like I didn't do a good job, but it wasn't when I didn't do a good job, but they didn't need any more exposure. Some of my physicians say, look, I just want you to take one or two fillings out at a time. Okay, that's fine. You know, I want to get in and do a quadrant at a time, but, you know, sometimes I have to do one or two on somebody. That's the way you've got to do it. Better health after detoxification by physician. That's what I'm saying. Got it out of the mouth, but got to get it out of the body. Better health immediately. That usually is a galvanic reaction, meaning we have an electrical discharge problem. Once you get the mercury out, then the electricity stops. The patient's better immediately. That's a galvanic reaction. That's not a, that's not a body burden reaction to mercury. Um, you know, again, as you get some people get better, uh, they're not completely better, but they're somewhat better, and they just need to get to the physician to continue to detox. It may not be mercury, it may be lead, molybdenum, cadmium, they may have some other issues going on there. Uh, what we use is called the cocktail. Joe, where's your break coming up?
Okay. All right. I'm just having so much fun, I didn't want to run over you. All right. What we use, and this came from our uh, naturopathic course, is this is what I take daily. Uh, I encourage my patients. It's on my website. We call it La Cocktail. Um, I prefer scotch, but this works real well for the, uh, the you know, getting the mercury out. Is cilantro, which you don't have to eat it. I hate cilantro, like, as a food. When I was a kid, uh, we lived down in Brownsville, Texas, and I had this friend of mine who was a Mexican kid, and I went over to his house all the time, and his mom would cook, and everything was great. But he had this tree outside, and, and, and with cilantro, there's another, there's another, um, what do you, cilantro would be an herb. But there's another herb that's on the same flower tree. Coriander? Okay, all right. Well, we'd eat these leaves off the cilantro, coriander tree, whatever it was, and it was pretty good. Well, for whatever reason, I went home and I got the flu that night, and I got so sick. And all I can remember was cilantro from the flu. To this day, I don't like cilantro. But when you get the extract of cilantro, it's in a dropper bottle. You can take some and put it in water. It's not like eating cilantro. So if you like cilantro, great. I don't care for it. Corella, probably Corella. Uh, you can get mercury along with it. You got to buy a very high quality Corella. You know, it's coming from seaweed. Seaweed filled with seawater. Uh, seawater contains heavy metals. So you got to be careful of that. Corella is a good um, motivator of heavy metal, particularly mercury, to move it out of the cells. But it doesn't always get out of the body. Cilantro is a very good activator where it gets the mercury out of the cell and then helps with Corella to move it out of the body. So you'd want to take both of these. Um, the other is alpha lipoic acid. Freeze-dried garlic. Freeze-dried garlic is very, very effective. It's got a lot of sulfur. And freeze-dried garlic is very effective in helping infections. Uh, garlic is it's the... Um, the anison, allicin in the garlic that's effective, the freeze-dried, for some reason, it still has the effect. Uh, also, it's high in sulfur, along with cabbage, Brussels sprouts, onions, broccoli, you know, all those uh, stinky foods, I guess you call it, cabbage. Uh, they're very good, to, and along with eggs, anything with sulfur in it is a good uh, a motivator to get the, get the mercury moving. Omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, mostly omega-3s. Uh, and we want this to go through the bowel. You do not want to have mercury go through the, uh, the kidneys. That's not its route to go. You want it to come through the bowel. It can really mess up your kidneys. That's why physicians need to do the chelation <clears throat> because you don't want to give yourself something where it's going to come through the urine. You want to come through uh, the bowel so the kidneys aren't affected. <coughs> Additional supplements be considered. Probiotics, you want to keep the gut healthy. Uh, I suggest I've got a lecture on vitamin D. I gave last time one to two thousand. Actually, I think you need more than that now. Um, I'd stay somewhere in the range of four to five thousand IUs of vitamin D a day, um, and I can talk on that for a couple hours. <clears throat> two thousand milligrams of liposomal vitamin C. That comes in a pack <clears throat> that's um, tolerated very, very easily by your stomach. Usually. If you take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C as powder, don't go out of the house because sooner or later, you're going to be real close to the bathroom. And it's a wonderful thing if you want to cleanse. I mean, on a Sunday morning, you're reading a paper. I mean, don't go to the mall when you're taking powdered vitamin C. You're going to be really sorry you did. But um, this liposomal vitamin C is 100% absorption through the liver. Uh, it passes through the stomach. It's uh, encapsulated, so the stomach thinks it's a fat. So when it gets to the small intestine, it's, it's uh, uh, digested and absorbed, a uh, very good thing to do. And again, the same company makes liposomal glutathione, glutathione the same way. Glutathione is probably the number one antioxidant, and it's probably going to give electrons to vitamin C. So uh, these two are very good antioxidants to be taking. Well, I also take the, the company, I can give you all this information. This is a personal choice of mine. Drucker liquid minerals and vitamins. This, this bottle of stuff has got everything in the world in it. I actually think I'm taking too much stuff. I think this Drucker would just about cover everything you need. Uh, Alkazone is another thing that just <clears throat> keeps your body uh, the lower pH so you have better oxygen absorption and at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, more energy. And then we mentioned the IMD, intestinal mental detox from Quicksilver Scientific. Uh, that's a powder 
that uh, I don't think you'd have a problem with your state board anywhere getting patients to take this, but, you know, I don't say that universally. You might want to check. And this is Joe on his 200th dive. He's decided to do a kind of hobby that doesn't tear himself up, but I've, um, I'm starting to think about shuffleboard. That would work, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes.